This is the Palin Update on Saranet Radio. I'm Kevin Shola. She's a 50-year-old adult bully, really is what she is, kind of a has-been comedian. Kathy, pick on me. Come up to Alaska and pick on me, but leave my kids alone. And Kathy Griffin, only one of the many bully cowards out there today. Are you sick of the left labeling themselves as tolerant and then being nothing more than bullies? You're not alone. Governor Palin agrees wholeheartedly. And so does our guest today, who's written a book about the subject. A book that Sarah Palin is praising. Editor-at-large at at Breitbart.com and author of the new book, Bullies, How the Left's Culture of Fear and Intimidation Silences America, is here, Mr. Ben Shapiro. Also, Ted Cruz gives a big thank you to Governor Palin and her supporters. Sarah Palin's brother says it may be party time, as in a third party. And our latest edition of Steel Resolve with Sarah Steelman is straight ahead. First, the author of Bullies, How the Left's Culture of Fear and Intimidation Silences America. Sarah Palin writing glowingly about this book this past week, calling Ben Shapiro's book great and calling his premise about the left's silencing tactics absolutely correct. Governor Palin says she has witnessed the left's bullying behavior up close and personal, at her of course, and at her family, plus the bullying treatment of other conservatives. Palin also blasts the phony war on women, saying, quote, There's something especially ugly about the way the left goes after children of conservatives. I still find it highly ironic that the supposedly tolerant left has done nothing but bully, demonize, and judge my daughter Bristol for making the right decision to keep her baby and work so very hard as a single mom to care and provide for him. I don't know of any conservative war on women, but I sure have seen the left's war on conservative women, unquote. Palin urges all to read Ben Shapiro's book and consider his advice about how we must stand up and push back twice as hard against the bullying. We are pleased to have Mr. Shapiro with us today on the Palin Update on Saranet Radio. Ben Shapiro, welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Bullies, Ben, is one of these books that we have to really say thank you for. This is something that has been ongoing and bothering so many, and it's about time someone put the pen to paper on it. This bullying tactic by the left, which centers on lies, scare tactics, and nastiness, but unfortunately, in far too many instances, works for them. Let's talk a little bit first about the premise of the book and get your basic message here. Who are these bullies, and what are they doing? Uh, the bullies are, are the folks on the left in the media, in government, uh, in organizations like Media Matters who are determined, bound and determined, not to have a serious political debate, but to demonize the other side, to call us racist, sexist, bigot, homophobes who are ignorant and stupid, and then they don't have to deal with our actual policy prescriptions. We saw Colin Powell, former Secretary of State, came out and he said that the Republican Party had a, quote, dark vein of intolerance. What he meant by that is that if you are a conservative, if you disagree with liberal positions, he basically said this, if you disagree with liberal positions, it's because you must be a racist. This is a way for the left to shut down the debate and never have a real discussion about the issues. It's incredibly successful, and it's why Republicans continue to lose elections. In this 2012 election cycle, the reason that Romney lost is because Mitt Romney spent most of the time trying to paint Barack Obama as a well-meaning, nice guy who is somewhat incompetent. And Barack Obama spent most of his time painting Mitt Romney as the scum of the earth who hated poor people and minorities. Who do you think is going to win that race? I really like how you point out that Obama and the left try to convey this caring, tolerant persona, but really they are the things they keep calling the right and freedom-loving Americans. Isn't that correct? They are. They are the thugs in the situation. They are the racists in the situation. They're the ones who want to water down racism so that encompasses everything that disagrees with their position. They're the ones who are trying to, they're the ones who are, who are really, you know, the bigots and, and the sexists, and they, and they don't want to have any discussions about what makes Americans' lives better. I mean, that's the bottom line to all this. They want to have discussions about how nasty we are, and we want to have discussions about actual issues. And no wonder they win, because if they continue to do this and we don't call it out, if we say, you guys are reasonable folks, and they say, you guys are a bunch of racist pieces of crap, <laughs> then of course, of course they're going to win. We just called them reasonable, and they called us absolutely unreasonable. So people are going to think that we are unreasonable because reasonable people just said that we were. And, and these are horrible things to be called in this country, especially when they're not true. They throw around words like racist and sexist and homophobe and, and yes, bullies and, and whatnot. But then their actions certainly don't back up the word picture. No, they don't. I mean, all of their actions are designed to be bullying tactics. Everything that they say about us is true of them. 
they're the real thugs in this situation. They're the ones who want to silence the debate. I mean, take a look at what they did with regard to, for example, Mitt Romney on the supposed talk about the 47%. What Mitt Romney was actually saying is that government dependency is bad for people. That was the argument that he was making. And he was saying that government dependency makes people buy into more government dependency. What the left took that as is he hates poor people. He doesn't want to solve any of their problems. Well, no, that's not the way that it works. We can have different policy prescriptions on issues, and then we can agree to disagree, or we can try and find some common ground. What we can't do is label each other a bunch of nasty human beings and then expect that we're going to have a compromised bipartisan solution. It's, it's a huge mistake. Look at what's going on with Sandy Hook. When the left says about Sandy Hook, they, I mean, I accused Piers Morgan of this last week, they stand on the, on the bodies of the dead kids at Sandy Hook, and then they proclaim that if you disagree with them, it's because you don't care about those kids. It's a vile smear tactic, but it's absolutely effective, especially when we go on the shows and we make the case for the Second Amendment, and then he comes back with, well, if you really cared about the dead children in Sandy Hook, you wouldn't be saying that. That's a very difficult charge to come back from, and that's why you have to, when you debate these things, lay out the fact that they are going to try to use these tactics up front, take the, take the bat away from them. Well, I did get a chance to catch that Piers Morgan deal. I usually don't tune in, needless to say, but you did a wonderful job there, Ben. Uh, you say these are the most despicable people in America. Many would tend to agree with you, but it's not voiced by many. And this is what a lot of Palin backers like, from people like yourself, from Governor Palin. Real talk, plain English, the truth, not the kowtowing and coddling of Obama and his friends. It, it, it's tough, though, I think, for some who are conservative or to the right or just going about their business every day. They feel that they need to be quiet because well, these words are thrown at them. They do, and, and they buy into the narrative. And instead of buying into the narrative, I mean, one thing I really like about Governor Palin is that she doesn't. I mean, she, she leads off with, you know, these people are trying to smear us, and therefore, you know, you should take everything they say with a grain of salt. It's very important when you do these things, when you have these discussions with leftists, that you get all the biases out on the table. There are reasonable leftists who just want to sit there and discuss policy and actually talk about what's best for the country. But the people who don't, it's not it's not only useless to try and talk policy with them. It's actually counterproductive because it grants them a level of legitimacy they don't deserve. If you go on, you know, Piers Morgan or Chris Matthews, and you actually try to talk policy with them, it's very clear they're not interested in doing that. They're interested in demagoguing. So it's important when you first when you debate these folks to, to let them know up front that you're not going to be bullied or kowtowed by them uh, and to punch back twice as hard. You know, President Obama's been doing this for years, and it's very successful. I think Governor Palin has done this, and it's successful. I think that people on the right tend not to. We tend to try and be civil with everyone. Well, there are a certain number of folks out there who don't deserve civility. They forfeited their right to civility by being uncivil in the first place. The left uses fear all the time. They're doing it now with guns, as you mentioned. They do it to old folks, too, with Social Security and other issues. And if you disagree with Obama, you have to be a racist, right? That's exactly right. If you disagree with President Obama, as Colin Powell said, it must be because you have a nefarious strain of racism surging beneath your skin. And that's, that's really a despicable thing. I mean, the, the fact is that in America, the worst thing you can call someone is racist because of the horrible history with race that we have in this country. And, and the truth is, that it's very difficult to defend from. I mean, if you look at a situation like George Zimmerman, the, the left uses race in the most cynical sort of way. George Zimmerman is a Hispanic guy who was a neighborhood watch person who was following what he thought might be a prospective criminal, was confronted by that guy, had his head beaten against the ground, against the pavement, and then shot him in Trayvon Martin. The left immediately turned it into white guy stalks black guy, shoots him in back of head, as Jesse Jackson put it. You know, doing that, Turns, it turns what is a normal kind of self-defense case or even a criminal investigation into a race case. And then you get the president of the United States involved saying that Trayvon Martin looked like his fictional son. The goal of that is to continue pushing this notion that America is such a race, nasty place that if you oppose President Obama, it's because secretly you're a racist. And that is what the left has done over and over and over again in this country. What they do is they make people feel as though by opposing the left, they run the risk of being called a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe who hates America. And if someone of Zimmerman's background were a victim of a white person, they would have called him Hispanic, right? Exactly. I mean, if he had been the one who was actually attacked, then of course he would have been Hispanic right off the bat. But because he wasn't that person, because he, as it turns out, George Zimmerman uh, was a person who, uh, by the way, he's an Obama voter, uh, because George Zimmerman was a person who you know, actually ended up killing a black person, and the Obama administration needed a, uh, they needed a convenient race story to underscore the message that America was a racist place. They simply labeled him white, and then afterward they had to go back and label him, quote-unquote, white Hispanic, which was just absurd. 
Talking with Ben Shapiro. Ben, do they really believe this stuff, that if you disagree with Obama, you're a racist, or do they just know this is an Alinsky tactic that can work? I think some of them know it's an Alinsky tactic. I, I think a lot of them agree with it. I think a lot of them actually think that we're bad, nasty people. Because here's Wow, the thing. they really liberalism, agree with that. <laughs> yeah, because, because here's the thing. Liberalism at root is not about evidence. Liberalism at root is not about what's the best policy for Americans. It's all about feeling. And if they ever got to the point where they actually thought we were decent human beings, they might have to have a political discussion. And if they had a basic evidentiary political discussion, they would have to look at things like, do our policies work? What, what liberalism is all about is feeling better than the other guy. It's about feeling special. It's about feeling as though you're in the moral right and the other person is in the moral wrong. And so it's actually very important for liberals to feel that people on our side of the aisle are morally deficient in some way. It, may, it means that they don't have to look at the consequences of their policy because we're bad human beings. So I don't know which is scarier, the ones who actually believe this stuff or those on the left who simply know their ideas are just so outrageous that the only way to get them past people is to demonize and vilify the opponents. Yeah, I'm not sure which one is scarier either. They're both, they're both intensely scary, and it really doesn't speak well of the political discourse. I, I think that we could have rational conversations, but I think the left doesn't want to have them, and I think it's a mistake for us to continue to pretend that the left is some sort of rational force in this country when they are clearly attempting to destroy us as a, with, with character attacks and assaults. This is my favorite part of your message. It's time to punch back twice as hard. I, I was just infuriated in 2008 and again in 2012. You touched on this briefly before. John McCain and Mitt Romney, respectively, they had to preface every criticism of Obama with but he's a nice guy, or he's a fine man over his head. What is that? All that comes across as, I'm okay, and so is he, but vote for me. You know, Sarah Palin tried to talk about the connections to Bill Ayers and the president's questionable background, but she was muzzled by the GOP establishment. Isn't it time we get candidates like, say, Ted Cruz, like a Sarah Palin, who call it as it really is? Absolutely, and they need to do it up front. I mean, I think that by the time Governor Palin got into the race, it was almost too late for that. I mean, it was because you really have one shot in a presidential race. It's defining your opponent, and you have to do it right at the beginning. You saw that Obama did it this time with Mitt Romney. Within, within five minutes of Mitt Romney's nomination, he was launching Bain Capital attacks, painting him as somebody who wanted to kill his former employees' wives of cancer. And he, he, didn't take, he didn't hesitate for a second. John McCain and Mitt Romney, meanwhile, went out of their way to paint Barack Obama as a genuinely nice fellow, good family man, solid guy you'd want to have a beer with, just not very good at his job. Well, if you have one, on one side of the aisle, you have somebody who is a really nice guy, just not great at his job, and on the other side of the aisle, you have someone who is the root of all evil in the universe. Uh, you're going to vote for the guy who's mildly incompetent, <laughs> and that's sort of what happened here. What about the Boehners and McConnells of the world? Not exactly spines of steel there? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that they, they really need to figure out what we're talking about here. I think that Boehner, you know, hopefully, he's going to start to figure this out soon. If he doesn't, he's going to be out on his ear. And he ought to be. He's not the only one. I mean, the people who are backing him up, the, the Eric Cantor's of the world, I'm not sure they're a whole hell of a lot better. Right. If, if, if Republicans are going to take back the party, they're going to have to stand with the Tea Party. The Tea Party is the only force in the country that really looks unapologetically at the politics of the situation and says, here's the right thing to do, and no matter what you call me, you can call me a racist, you can call me a sexist, you can call me whatever you want. I understand that you're demagoguing the issue. Um, unless the Republican Party starts to recognize the power inherent in its position, it's going to continue to work. I don't know that anyone has gotten more of the bullying treatment than Sarah Palin, her family, to Bristol Palin, who's just such a nice person, ripped apart by the left. Why are they so scared of Governor Palin and her family, and, and why are they just so downright mean? Well, they're frightened of Governor Palin because Governor Palin happens to be a woman who's conservative. I mean, it's the same reason that they don't like me. I'm a Jew who's conservative. Anytime there's somebody, and here's the left's whole philosophy in a nutshell. Their whole philosophy is we stand up for victimized groups, women, Jews, blacks, gays, any victimized minority group. We're the ones standing up for them. And therefore, people on the other side who oppose our agenda, they hate all those groups. By necessity, they hate all those groups. So when Governor Palin, who's obviously a woman, says, look, I don't believe that. I'm a, you know, I'm a woman, and I believe the best policies for women are Republican. It totally throws them out off kilter, because now they actually are, they now theoretically, they have to discuss the issue. Now they, they can't demonize her as somebody who hates women. It makes it real tough. Similarly, they can't demonize me as somebody who hates Jews. It makes it very difficult. So the, so the fact is that she poses a real threat. They do the same thing with black Republicans, too. Anybody who's a member of a quote-unquote victimized group in America who happens to be conservative, it's top of the hit list for the left, because if the left does not eliminate them, then the left loses the argument by default. 
And by the way, Bristol Palin is giving away some copies of your book on her blog site. So uh, both uh, her and the governor very much, uh, as you know, endorsing this great book, Ben. Yeah, they're very sweet of them, and uh, obviously I'm a big fan. And there are all different kind of bullies right now, too, not just politicians. You mentioned the media, for one. Oh, the media is worse than any of them. The, media, the politicians are bad. The media is the enabler, because the media pretends that it's objective. Politicians, they have a D next to their name. You should know they're liberal. When you have folks like George Stephanopoulos pretending at objectivity, when in reality the guy's a former Clinton staffer, then, uh, then it's just it's absurd. It, it, it really is. It's, it's this Orwellian world that we live in where the media, which is clearly left, pretends that it's objective, and the people on the right who say that they're right are called dishonest for being right-wing. It's, 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 it's ridiculous, but it's, it's incredibly effective. And, and so I, that's why I always make a point whenever I'm on any of these shows, and I think Governor Palin's done it too, of saying up front, look, George, I understand all your questions are going to come from the left. I, I know where you're coming from. I know what your tactics are. And now let's discuss the issues. Yeah, not many people do it. You did it great with the Piers Morgan deal. You're right. The governor's done it. I've seen maybe Newt Gingrich, but not yeah. not many. And here they agree to these debates, moderated by far left uh, people. Um, so they're 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 falling right right into it. And uh, the way you set the tone, let's say, with Piers Morgan was wonderful. Uh, finishing up here, you worked with Andrew Breitbart. I knew Andrew a little bit. Breitbart news bigger than ever. What do you think Andrew would think of this book? Uh, I think Andrew would, would would love this book. I mean, Andrew was, and I'm not saying that just to sell it. And this was the theme of Andrew's life was fighting bullies. And somebody who knew Andrew since I, I, I was 17 years old when I met Andrew. Now I'm about to turn 29, so I knew him for well over a decade. Um, and you know, Andrew, he always said to me that his main goal in life was to fight the bullies. The truth is, Andrew wasn't even a deeply political guy. He's just somebody who didn't like bullying and thug tactics. And he looked at what the left did to people like Clarence Thomas, and he said these people are despicable. And he made it his life's message, message to fight on behalf of those those sorts of people against the bullies. And uh, and I think that in large part, not only did he succeed, but I think that he he taught a lot of people that it's more it is it is vitally important that we walk toward the fire, that we simply fight the fight. And if they're going to call us names, well, so be it. But this is the fight that we've this is the fight we've we didn't pick this fight, but we're going to end it. Ben, great stuff. How can people get their hands on your book? They should go to Amazon.com. Take a look for bullies. Or go to uh, Breitbart.com, which is heavily covered there. Uh, your local bookstore should also have copies of Bullies. Ben Shapiro, thank you, sir. Thanks so much. For more on Ben Shapiro and this great new book, Bullies, How the Left's Culture of Fear and Intimidation Silences America, head to BenjaminShapiro.com. Some wonderful words from now Senator Ted Cruz this past week, thanking Sarah Palin and her supporters for helping him get elected. Cruz wrote to Palin's political action committee, Sarah Pack, saying, Together, we made history this November. Our victory in the U.S. Senate race in Texas was a remarkable testament to the conservative grassroots. We started out as underdogs in a long competitive primary, but despite the odds being stacked against us, Governor Palin and Sarah Pack showed daring leadership by endorsing my campaign. The governor's vision and the support of patriots like you helped transform my long-shot candidacy into victory on election night. Thank you. Cruz also named some other top conservatives like Senators Deb Fisher and Jeff Flake. Cruz closes by saying, quote, I am humbled and grateful for the continuing support of patriots like you, unquote. To see his entire note, go to sarapac.com. Our friend Chuck Heath Jr., Sarah Palin's brother, recently made his opinion known on what may have to happen to get us back on track. Chuck posting on Facebook about an issue he's been thinking about for some time. He writes, enough is enough. Has the third party's time come? Chuck states, we've lost our way. The American political system is a mess. The divisiveness between Republicans and Democrats seems insurmountable, and it's getting worse every day. Then he asked for feedback, and boy, did he get it. Could Sarah Palin get on board with this idea? Could we see a viable third party in this country challenge Democrats and the Republican establishment? It's all interesting. Chuck Heath writes a lot of thought-provoking stuff. If you haven't seen his site yet, be sure you visit ChuckHeathJR.com. It is worth a stop. By the way, I had a lot of fun appearing on Anita Finley's show this past week, Finley and Smart Talk. If you missed it... You'll find a link for it right on saranetradio.net. We discussed Chuck Heath Jr.'s idea and much, much more. And for those of you who did hear it, thanks so much for the warm response. Really had a blast on the program. Now it's time for our weekly commentary, Steel Resolve. Here's Sarah Steelman. 
Thanks, Kevin. On the heels of the so-called fiscal cliff deal, the next major battle will come over the lifting of the debt ceiling. The president is already making bold statements about how he will not negotiate with Congress about raising the debt ceiling. I sure hope we don't allow him to get away with that. Congress needs to use this opportunity to pass significant spending cuts and or get a balanced budget passed. Standard & Poor's has already downgraded U.S. debt because Congress will not deal with long-term debt reduction. President Obama tries to say that this downgrade occurred because of failure to raise the debt ceiling. Nothing could be further from the truth. Moody's, who may take action to downgrade U.S. debt this time around, said negotiations should, quote, lead to specific policies that produce a stabilization and then downward trend in the ratio of federal debt to the size of the economy over the medium term, close quote. We the people should demand Congress to not raise the debt ceiling unless a balanced budget is passed with a cap on the size of government. This is the only way we will get our country headed back in the right direction and get our fiscal house in order. This is Sarah Steelman for Net Radio. Tune in again next week for another segment of Steel Resolve right here on the Palin Update. And don't forget the Palin Update, including Steel Resolve, is now on demand and available for download. So just head to saranetradio.net, pick the show you want to hear, and you can listen anywhere, anytime. Also, please follow us on Twitter, at Saranet Radio, at Kevin Shola, and at Sarah underscore Steelman. Well, that'll just about do it for this edition of the Palin Update on Saranet Radio. Visit saranetradio.net for continuing coverage of Governor Palin. I want to thank Sarah Steelman and everyone here at Saranet Radio. Thanks to Ben Shapiro. And thank you for listening today. Please be sure to join us next time for another edition of the Palin Update. I'm Kevin Shola. Have a pleasant day.